Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Antioch Beverly. It's just so good to be with you all this morning. Um, my name is Katie, and I'm one of the lead pastors here. Um, my husband, Ben, and I are leading together. Um, and yeah, it's good to see you all this morning. So before we begin worship, we're just going to take some time, greet someone near you, and uh, say hello. Welcome each other. for us. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Thank you, Lord. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Yes, Lord, we taste and see that you are good. No matter the circumstance in our life, no matter what it is that we are going through, God, we declare that you are good. Things around us are changing, but Lord, you never change. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing together. See you. 
take a moment and just think of the things that you're thankful for. And I want you to thank God for them. You can whisper it. You can say it out loud. Recognizing every perfect gift comes from the Lord. Thanks for all the gifts that you have given us. Lord, you are worthy. Ultimately, we thank you for Jesus. For the gift of your son. So that our sins would be forgiven. So that we could come before you. Nothing holding us back. Nothing is separating us from your love. Thank you, God. Thank you for your presence that is constantly with us. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for this morning. Thank you for your, for your faithfulness, God. Father of kindness.
thank you for being faithful.
We're going to continue in worship um, through taking communion right now. I'm going to read this scripture, and then someone's going to come and pass the elements around. And you can feel free to um, take it on your own or take it with your family or friends that you came with. And I just invite you to just pray before, um, before you partake of the, the bread and the, um, the juice. So hear this word from the Lord. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup.
Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice of your life, for becoming like us, for giving yourself so that we could be made whole. God, we thank you that we are washed by your blood. We are washed clean. And there's nothing separating us from your love. Thank you, Jesus. At this time, we're going to take the offering. This is our opportunity to give our first fruits to God, who has graciously blessed us with all things. So we have different ways you can give. I know a lot of people give online. Um, we'll also pass the baskets around at this time. We have a, a box in the back as well. Um, the instructions should be up on the screen if you'd like to give online. Um, but as we're doing this, I just want to say this is an act of worship. So I just invite you to take a moment, and even like if you have your, your tithes taken out automatically online, I invite you to just take a minute and pray. Give thanks to the Lord for his provision in your life, recognizing that all things come from him, putting your trust in him, and just ask the Lord about, about your giving. Join me in, in praying together. God, we thank you for all of the blessings you pour out on us. God, we thank you first and foremost for your son, Jesus, and your provision through him. And God, we just ask that you would use these gifts that we have given today, that we, that we give, Lord, that you would use them to your service for the advancement of your kingdom here on this earth. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So at this time, I'd like to invite um, John Neal, our um, kids ministry coordinator, and he is going to give an announcement before um, we dismiss our children. Good morning. I'm John, and I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you guys are here. I just wanted to say, uh, to share with you a little bit, we are running our, our Compass Kids program, which is really ages four through 11, three to, anyway, three to 11, but we're also wanting to let you know that we are setting up a space for nursery age kids, and for parents can just kind of come and hang out with their own kids in a space that's safe, in a space that there's some books and toys, and I believe even um, some technology to kind of live stream what's happening in here via the Facebook app or um, other ways. So just wanted to make sure you're aware of that, and we're glad to be able to work together as a family to just love on our kids and provide a place where they can connect with us and connect with Jesus, whether they're two or 92. So, in light of that then, as we prepare to launch the children, we're going to share a blessing over them, as is our tradition. So, if you can join with me uh, and extend a hand towards a child, and if there's not one nearby, you can reach, or you can also put one even on your own heart, for you are also God's loved child. You are the beloved, God's dearly loved child forever and always adored by him. Jesus is proud to be your brother and you are led by his voice. You are filled with the spirit. God is always with you. Your delight is the Lord and you look to him to meet all your needs. 
You are the beloved. You are never alone. All right, kids, enjoy your class and enjoy your teachers. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Ben, and I am the interim lead pastor here. And uh, here at Antioch Beverly, one of the things that we value is prayer. And we believe prayer really works, that the Lord hears us. And uh, so we're going to spend just two or three uh, minutes in a brief time of prayer. And whether you uh, want to do that on your own or whether you want to do that with the people around you, uh, whether you want to do that silently, that is totally up to you. But uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer. And um, we want to focus outward. And so we pray for a country every week. And uh, the nation of Ukraine is going through a lot right now. And so we want to lift up the nation of Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, and, um, and that whole region, really, um, and what they're experiencing. Uh, we want to lift up our neighbors. Right? We're called to do life together in community. And so pray for your neighbors. Pray for them by name if you know them. Pray for your sweet mates, um, those of you in college and things like that. And, um, and then we want to pray for the foster care movement here on the North Shore. There's uh, a great need. And we want to continue to lift up families, to lift up children who are in need of homes. And so uh, we're going to continue to prioritize that here. So. Uh, let's take two or three minutes and spend some time in prayer. Thanks.
would you hear us when we pray? That nothing is too small for you, Lord, and nothing is too great. Pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. It's good to be together. It's good to be with all of you. And um, like I said, my name is Ben, and I'm one of the lead pastors here at Antioch Beverly. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get into the word today. Uh, the first one is, if you're a visitor, we want to welcome you, um, and we're so glad that you're here. We have, um, we don't want to embarrass you or anything, but if you are a visitor for the first time, we'd love to, again, welcome you. Um, maybe you'd like to raise your hand in church. Can we give them a, a round of applause if you're a visitor for the first time? I know we've got a couple people. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. We have a small gift for you that I'd love to give to uh, you at the end of the service. So I'd love to check in and just say hi. So uh, we we want to welcome you and welcome everybody here as well. It's great to great to see all of you. A couple of quick announcements. Um, this Tuesday at 7.15 at the Beverly Library is a wonderful opportunity um, to pray together, not just as the Church of Antioch Beverly, but the Big C Church. Uh, we're a part of the North Shore Gospel Partnership, and there are several churches in this area who are all partnering together not in competition, right? It's not a competition, but in a spirit of cooperation over what the Lord is doing in Beverly and the North Shore. So what a great opportunity to come together as the Big C Church and to pray with one another from all different churches um, unified in the cause that is Jesus in Beverly. And so you're all invited. That's um, at the Beverly Public Library, 7.15 p.m., this coming Tuesday evening. We also have another uh, a fifth Sunday coming up. For those of you that aren't familiar with fifth, uh, our fifth Sundays, this is an opportunity for our church to not meet at our regularly scheduled time, but actually to partner um, with groups and projects around the area and different churches um, and serve our community and serve our neighborhood. And, um, and so there's all sorts of projects and, and all different churches that we work with, but what a wonderful way to communicate Jesus by serving our neighbors. And so these projects look like all sorts of things. Um, sometimes we have painting projects here at Air. Sometimes we are feeding people. Sometimes we're writing letters to those who um, are dealing with incarceration. And so there's just, there's something for everyone and we want to hear your ideas as well. So if you have an idea for a project, um, we would love to hear that. That's happening on the 30th of October, uh, right before Halloween. I bet there's some kind of Halloween-themed outreach or something like that that we could do. But um, So fifth Sunday, um, we'd love to partner with all of you on that. Um, and then my last announcement is we had some awesome auditions this, uh, this morning with Sandy, our theater director, um, our skit director, and, um, and she's looking for somebody who is organized, who would be willing to assist her and help her out. Um, and that's uh, just a small way that you can help in facilitating our Advent skits that are gonna be coming up in the last week in November. So we're excited about that. Sandy needs a little bit of help with that, and so if, you're, if you are organized and, and coordinated, I'd love for you to, to check in with Sandy. Sandy, maybe you could raise your hand so that people know who you are. We know who you are, but um, that's great. So, awesome. Well, I have the, I have the privilege today to, uh, to bring the word, and, um, and I'm excited to do so. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> I haven't done so in a couple of weeks, and um, it really is a privilege to, to be with all of you and to be able to do that. And so, um, would you just bow your heads one more time, um, since it's certainly not about me. This is what, what the Lord wants to share, so. Father, I thank you that you are speaking. Lord, that your desire is to be with your people. Lord, I just pray for clarity and discernment. 
for the words that you want to share through me. And Lord, we just thank you for that in advance, in faith of what you're doing. In your precious name we pray. Amen. The story of George Mueller is a fascinating one. He was a 19th century philanthropist, and I think I have a picture of him, you might be able to see him, and pastor who had a heart for children. Not that I want to sing his praises, but he started over 117 schools, he cared for over 10,000 orphans, and educated over 120,000 children and was accused of raising many of the poor above their station in life. He didn't have any kind of conventional fundraising formula or anything. He uh, was forced to take prayer for daily bread, quite literally. And on one occasion, over 300 orphans were waiting to receive breakfast, and he didn't have anything for them. Being a teacher, I know what it's like sometimes when people are wanting to get something, to get food or things like that, and sometimes you can feel the pressure. And I'm sure that George Miller uh, felt the pressure at this time, and he decided to step out in faith. He prayed a prayer, thanking God in advance for what he was going to give them. And lo and behold, suddenly, and I think it probably was quite sudden, there was a knock on the door. And the local town baker came up with three massive fresh trays of bread and said, you know what, I've been thinking about you for weeks and do you have any need for all this bread that I baked? I can imagine George Muller must have started to crack a little bit of a smile, right? And then just a few minutes later, the milkman, a concept we're no longer familiar with, okay? But I remember, the milkman came knocking on the door. His cart broke down right in front of the orphanage and he was worried that all of this fresh, creamy milk was about to go bad. And Mr. Muller, would you have any use for all of this fresh milk? Hundreds of children were fed fresh baked bread, washed down with fresh creamy milk. And I'm sure that they were changed by that experience of praying and, um, and receiving, literally, their daily bread. Now some of us might, might be thinking, maybe we're a little bit skeptical, maybe we're a little cynical, I know the world can be sometimes, and some would, and, and maybe will dismiss that, hey, that, Ben, that, that was a nice coincidence. That was a wonderful coincidence that all these things happened. And I found it interesting that the Archbishop William Templeton uh, famously said something about this. He said, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I stop praying, the coincidences stop happening. A little food for thought there. We're in the middle of a series called Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And it's focused on the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. And over the last two weeks, John Ketchum and Pat Schumann preached on verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And... Uh, John was looking at that passage through the lens of intercession, and Pat was looking at it through the lens of unanswered prayer. And today, we're going to continue our exploration of the Lord's Prayer, looking at verse 11, which is, give us this day our daily bread. 
I just want to give a little bit of context for this. It's important to understand that at this point, the prayer is almost actually halfway done. Out of the six petitions in the prayer, the first three have already been addressed. And all three of those petitions are God-centered, God-focused. The themes of those are adoration and thanksgiving and submission to his will, hopefully turning us away from our own self-centeredness. And in my research for this sermon, because, hey, I'm, I am a lay person, but I was reading up about this, and, um, and I, I found it really interesting, and it looks like Jesus adopted and adapted this prayer from another contemporary prayer. prayer from that time. The Kadesh is one of the three most important prayers in Jewish liturgy. And I was blown away by this. Um, the opening lines of the, of the Kadesh says, magnified and holy, hallowed be his great name in this world which he created according to his will. And may he establish his kingdom during your life. One scholar said that Jesus softens the Kadesh's concern with the vertical access of God's greatness and his impending kingdom with our Father. And I put the comparison up there um, so you can see both sides. And then adds his own horizontal access, a list of simple petitions for food, safety, protection, and forgiveness. Jesus surrounds the reverence and longing of the original prayer with relational language and practical requests regarding the everyday concerns of ordinary people. So now that our vision has been, been clarified and reframed by the greatness of God, right in the first part of the Lord's Prayer, we can turn to our own needs and those of the world with, again, verse 11 of Matthew 6 saying, give us this day our daily bread. Augustine writes about how daily bread is a metaphor for necessities and not luxuries. And since the first three petitions are about how God is our true food, our true wealth and happiness, then Jesus is charging us to bring this prayer list of these necessities, of these needs and not wants into line with the prior three petitions, with the essence of the first half of the Lord's prayer. I was thinking about this and thankfully, God did not grant some of my earnest prayers when I was younger. Otherwise, I probably would have been a professional surfer living in you know, a little beach bungalow in Laguna Beach, California, probably playing in a punk rock band and, and might have married like five other people, right? Because of my earnest prayers in, in the beginning. Thankfully, I'm, one, I'm married to my wonderful wife, Katie. <clears throat> but I'm not sure those things were really praying in alignment with your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As Pete Gregg of Emmaus Church in England said, I love this quote, daily bread means daily bread. Nutella is not guaranteed. <laughs> God invites us, and this is the continuation of his quote, God invites us to ask him for the basics but has never promised to make us millionaires. It's true, isn't it? So I'd like to frame a little bit of our daily bread with um, Proverbs 30, verse 8. And, um, and it really spoke to me. And it says this, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. And this is the part. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread, just what I need. 
Meet me where I'm at, Lord. This isn't such a foreign concept in the Bible. You know, in Exodus 16, the people of Israel were grumbling in the desert. Are you familiar with the story? Maybe you are, maybe you're not, right? The people of Israel have just been delivered from the Pharaoh's hands, rather miraculously. And it's interesting, in Exodus 16, they, they're delivered and they start grumbling almost immediately, complaining that now they're going to starve once they made it um, out of Pharaoh's clutches and are in the desert. Isn't that amazing? How God delivered them and how fickle we can be as humans sometimes. And already they start grumbling about, well, what now? What are we going to do next? And so they were instructed to collect the manna or bread each day. It only stayed fresh one day, by the way. If you read in Exodus 16, uh, with the exception of um, collecting before the Sabbath, people who tried to collect more than enough, the Bible says in Exodus 16 that the manna started to stink. It went rotten and it filled with worms. It was only that day. Our daily bread is asking about today's needs rather than tomorrow's wants. It requires that we do it daily. I heard Kevin DeYoung, who's a pastor in North Carolina, say, it'd be nice if it said, give us this day our yearly bread. So we didn't have to keep going to God and only had to do it once a year. But that's not really how Jesus wants us to live. I confess, part of me wants that sometimes. Look, can you just give me the yearly supply so I don't have to keep on coming to you? But that's not what he wants. He wants us to be reminded that his mercies are new every morning. Thank you, Lord. So every morning we need to anticipate and we also need to pray that God would give to us new mercies, fresh grace every day. That's how God had the Israelites live in the wilderness. He said, I'm going to give you enough. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what God said here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you enough, enough manna for this day. So don't go out thinking that you can cheat the system and, and hoard a bunch more. You need to trust me. Wake up tomorrow and I'll provide for your needs tomorrow as well. Well, some of you might be thinking, Ben, why do we actually need to ask? Isn't God omniscient? Doesn't he know everything anyways? He's omnipresent too, so he's, he's everywhere, so he knows everything. Why do we actually have to ask? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. I think the story of the blind man Bartimaeus is actually really helpful in us understanding why the Lord wants us to ask. And so if you have your Bibles, yeah, we're going to read from the Bible today. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. And I'm going to be reading from the ESV version, and I think we have it up on the screen as well. And so this is a story of Bartimaeus. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him telling him to, shh, be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. 
And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. When I was in my teacher prep program, just a young buck, the age of 20, at Gordon College, I remember uh, my professor saying, Ben, make sure you use wait time. It's really helpful. It indicates there's something important. Did you, did you catch it? It's right at the question that Bartimaeus asks. Isn't it kind of an interesting question? Maybe? What do you want me to do for you? I'm sure Bartimaeus was probably thinking, well, isn't it kind of obvious? <laughs> I'm blind. Lord, I want to see. And then Jesus healed him. People often ask, why do we need to pray? Doesn't God already know all of our needs? <laughs> I think the story of Bartimaeus reveals that it's not enough to sometimes sit quietly or silently in the crowd wishing for a miracle. Jesus inquires, what do you want me to do for you? He asks us to ask. He invites us to articulate our specific needs. Well, why? I've got three points. Why does he want us to ask? Well, number one, the act of asking is relational. Jesus is always more interested in friendship than in dispensing blessings to faceless souls. Now, that doesn't mean that he can't heal somebody completely anonymously. Of course he can. But he does de de desire relationship. Think about the story of the woman with the issue of blood. This woman had been uh, hemorrhaging. She had been bleeding for 12 years, right? And as the story goes, she reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And he feels the power go out of him. And he stops, right? And he says, who touched me? He wants to identify her and speak with her. He didn't just heal her anonymously. And in that same passage, Jesus goes to, um, to raise the girl who, um, who died, raise her back to life. And the very first thing that he does after that is he says, give her something to eat. Isn't that pastoral? Isn't that like relational, right? He wants us to ask because asking emphasizes relationship. The second point, the act of asking makes us vulnerable. That's a hard thing. It's a hard thing for me. I don't know about you. It's a hard thing to sometimes be vulnerable, to admit that I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. When we ask, we become vulnerable. We admit our personal needs and extend trust towards the person asked, in this case, Jesus. This might be a minor act of faith, like, Lord, uh, my gas light's on. Can you help me get to the next gas station? A while ago, we were... Uh, we took the kids camping and we were up in Acadia and we were driving back down. I remember being um, under a little bit of time pressure because Katie was doing uh, like a worship service thing down in Waltham. And, um, and we were driving and I, and 
I'm guilty of this. Is anybody else guilty of this? Like, I will go as far as possible. It's like I'm, you know, trying to see how far I can go without having to actually fill up um, the tank. And so we're driving, and we're on 95, and, um, and the light's been on for a while, and Katie's very pleasantly asking me, um, are you going to get gas? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get gas. Don't worry, don't worry. And we're, uh, I don't know, they changed all the exit numbers now, but it's like exit 55 by uh, Georgetown, and all of a sudden, the car stopped running. And I'm like, oh my gosh. She has to be somewhere at like one o'clock and it's, you know, 1130 down in, and she's got to be down in Waltham. And so I'm like probably going 65 miles an hour. See, son, I drive by the speed limit and we go and we, we're cruising now. We, the, the car is off and we're cruising and I'm like, Shh, everybody, I'm concentrating here. And we go up the exit and we're still cruising. I'm like. Katie, look out the left-hand side. I'm not stopping. I'm not stopping. And I turn, and thankfully there was no car coming. And right on the corner there in Georgetown is a gas station. I literally float up, and uh, and we we like I inch up to to the um, to the gas thing. And um, it was an incredible moment. And of course I like, you know. Oh, of course, I meant to do that, but inside, internally, I was quietly dying, thinking, if I mess this up, I am in huge trouble. My point being, it might be something small, but it also can be the big things, too. Asking somebody to marry you, looking for that right mate, asking a doctor to help you with the disease. These are big things. But in all these forms, the little things and the big things, asking is an expression of faith. It's a way of opening our hearts, making ourselves vulnerable to believe and opening our hands to receive Jesus. Last point. The act of asking is intentional. We have to be intentional. It involves the activation of our wills. I feel like sharing personal stories can be helpful sometimes. And this is a, a a relevant and a recent one. Katie will love this story. Uh, so a couple nights ago, um, Katie wanted to talk to me and she wanted to be, she's laughing because she knows exactly what I'm about to share. She wanted to be intentional and, um, and I confess, uh, I'm pretty sure I was on my phone when she started talking to me and I made the mistake of not putting it away. And she said, hello, I'm trying to be intentional here. Can you look at me? I'm being very vulnerable with all of you, okay? Um, I am not this, like, amazing person. <laughs> and, um, and she wanted to be intentional. And asking Jesus about our necessities is intentional. As I said, it involves the activation of our wills. You see, God respects us too much to ride roughshod over our free will. We have free will. And he loves us too much to force us to do his bidding. He comes where he is welcomed. And he waits to answer when we call on him. But we have to ask. We have to be intentional. We have to be relational. We have to be vulnerable. Finally, give us, in give us this day, give us this day our daily bread is suggestive of the communal. 
the communal act of this request, whether it be by, by, with family or the larger community. I was struck by that. Martin Luther reflects on this idea and suggests that to pray, give us all the people of our land daily bread, is to pray for a just society. And these are his words, free of wanton exploitation, which crushes the poor and deprives them of their daily bread. I found that really interesting. Could there be a communal ask in give us this day our daily bread? What about the injustice in this world where not everybody can get their daily bread? What about those necessities? For Luther, at least, to pray for our daily bread is to pray for a just social order. You know, we live increasingly in isolation. I think part of that was COVID, but I think also, uh, I think our culture encourages, and this is my opinion, that our, I think our culture encourages us both implicitly and explicitly to live isolated lives that center around what is best for me and my situation. Even in church, we sometimes encounter that. Please hear me, this, there's no condemnation, there's no guilt or anything like that. But I think there is also power in the community of believers in living our lives together. The plural nature of the Lord's Prayer, like we ask God to give us what we need, suggests that as much as possible, and this is from John Calvin, he said, the prayers of Christians ought to be public to the advancement of the believer's fellowship. Meaning that sometimes living life together, doing life together, sometimes praying together, there is strength in that as believers. I think we should pray with others both formally and gathered worship together and informally. And if the substance of prayer is to continue a conversation with God, and if the purpose of it is to know God better, then in some ways this can happen best in community. Maybe you're thinking like, what do you mean, Ben? Well, I was reading um, this author, his name is C.S. Lewis, and, uh, and he was talking about in his book called The Four Loves. And he was talking about this relationship that he had with his friends. And um, it, was, it was really interesting. He, he mentioned how actually there were multiple layers of relationship that were revealed when different people were around. So as he was getting to know one person, um, he knew them from that perspective. But then when a second person who knew the person he was getting to know came, it added another dimension, another layer to that relationship. And he says, and this is Lewis, he says, by myself, I'm not large enough to call the whole man into activity. I want other lights, other relationships, than my own to show all his facets. I was really struck by that. And, um, and Tim Keller said, if it takes a community to know an ordinary human being, then how much more necessary would it be to get to know Jesus? Get to know Jesus alongside others. By praying with friends, you'll be able to hear and see facets of Jesus that you have not perceived. Because we all pray differently. We all connect differently. And so there's this wonderful communal aspect to give us this day our daily bread. These necessities are not too small for God. 
He wants us to ask. He wants to connect with us relationally. He wants us to be vulnerable, as hard as that is sometimes. And he wants us to be intentional. I want to invite the band to come, up, come on up. And um, it's just a couple of opportunities to respond here as we, as we wrap up. I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, but if you don't know Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with him, then I would love to talk with you about that. I'll be up here by the front, or I'd love to connect with you during the week. Um, But if you don't have that relationship with him and you desire it and you want it, I would love to talk with you about that. An opportunity for response might be to speak to Jesus, to be vulnerable. Maybe there's an issue you're going through. Maybe there's a relationship problem that you're dealing with. Maybe you have an issue with God right now. He's big enough to handle it all. He desires our relationship. He he desires our intentionality. He desires us to be vulnerable with him. Talk to him. There's also an opportunity for for us to do this in community. I'm gonna be up the front and and John will be up the front if, if you would like to pray with somebody. But certainly you're not confined to coming up to the front. We're the community of believers. And to the extent that you feel comfortable, you could look across the aisle and say, hey, would you be willing to pray for me? That might be hard. Because it requires vulnerability. And there's no pressure whatsoever. You can do that on your own. But there's an invitation here for us to participate, for us to engage. And I invite you to do so. So we're gonna go ahead and, um, and sing a song of response. And I, I invite you to respond in a way that is most fitting for you.
Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. God, help us remember that every day, Lord, that we can come before you, trusting that you have good things for us each day, Lord, that you provide everything that we need. Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's good to be with you all. Receive the benediction. May you go with God. May you dream dreams. May you see visions. May you love deeply and may you know that you are deeply loved. Amen.